I won't deny it, I'm a south sider. You don't wanna mess with me. Got the police looking for me. But I'm calm cause I'm smoking that CBD. Said I won't deny it, I'm a south sider. You don't wanna mess with me. Got the police looking for me. But I'm chilling in the back of the VIP. Said we won't deny it, we are south siders. You don't wanna mess with us. Got the police looking for us But there's nothing that they can't do Cause you're chilling with the Blessed Life Podcast crew The Blue Podcast, <laughs> Piches Cabrones <laughs> Piches Cabrones <laughs> Feliz Domingo, mis amigos Welcome to the Blue Podcast I'm Brian Tierney This is the Blessed Life University Podcast The Blue Podcast for short Today we're going to be talking about um, Suicide awareness for the police we're going to be talking about uh, resilience as a general topic. Uh, we're going to define it, talk about what it means to us, and talk about some sp- specific examples. We're going to be talking about self-care, journaling, gratitude, healing from childhood um, trauma. And at the end, Matt and I are going to be talking about Ukra- the Ukrainian offensive right now, um, stuff that's going on with Pusha, uh, Putin, Russia, and nuclear threats, and also interest rate increases. Here with me to talk about all this today is Lisette Vargas, yes. Tilsa Fernandez, and Matt Thomason, also known as Mateo. Gee. So um, Lisette is a new friend of mine. We're going to be learning about her, so we'll get a little bit of her bio in a second. Tilsa, y'all know Tilsa, the co-host with the most host, <laughs> um, from Divine Yoni Goddess um, and Divine Wedding Vow. So if you need to get married and you need an offic- uh, officiant, and you need somebody who's cheery with a smile on their face and is always full of great style and class, talk to Tilzo Damari Fernandez. Um, with me here on the other side of the table, Mateo, Matt Thomason, captain in the U.S. Army and attorney at Thomason and Tierney Law Firm right here practicing law with me in Chicago, Illinois. Turn up. <laughs> turn up. <laughs> turn up. Light those candles and burn them up. Burn them up. Burn them up. Hey. Drinking water. Because we had enough of the other stuff. Oh, but, plenty um, enough, yeah. <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> yesterday was Oktoberfest, and we're going to be talking about self-care and all that. And uh, speaking of October, yeah. Sober October begins today. I'm going to be just drinking water and non-alcoholic beers on this podcast and in my life in general from October all the way up until St. Patrick's Day. I commend you for your for your dedication, man. You did this, you did this last year. It went all the way to St. Patty's Day. So, I mean, me... You know, obviously, uh, <laughs> I'm not doing self care. So I sit here drinking a white claw and ripping on a fat vape. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, my self care could use some improvement, certainly. But I was thinking about getting a Red Bull for today, but I just downsized the coffee. So I got uh, normally I do a large hot half decaf with cream only, and uh, today I did a medium instead because uh, like that shit dehydrates you. You know, mm-hmm. the caffeine does give you that mental jolt to yeah. get going for stuff like this, but. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I didn't want to dehydrate myself further, so I've been drinking liquid IV and this water. It's this water is so delicious out of the filter machine. It's cold and just refreshing. I fucking love it, man. Cheers, guys. Cheers. cheers. Happy Sunday, everybody. Look at all you healthy people. people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual cheers across the table. <laughs> Prost, as they say at Oktoberfest. Prost, Prost. Drinking. The one thing that I didn't realize is how close. German music, Polish music, and Mexican music is like yes. so close and similar. shit. Yes. Like the stuff they were playing yesterday uh-huh. was like stuff like there would be like ranch music in very Mexico. Similar. You know, sounded the same. We, we we I think we were very good dancers. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. I felt like I was a good dancer. Yeah. Was it actually? I don't know. Maybe it was all the beer. <laughs> yeah, it's but funny. in my head, I was like, yeah, killing it. <laughs> the same beat, everything. Even the accordion sounded just the same. Mm-hmm. There's there's nothing as smooth as the sound of an accordion when you hear it. It's like it, it flows. It's like it's like clouds that flutter and flow. It's like a butterfly. It just it just sails along so well. You uh-huh. know the sound of it. I've really become attuned to that because before I, I I didn't that music was like a little too laid back for me. But now that I've been hanging out with a lot of people in the Mexican community mm-hmm. and closing a lot of real estate deals with a lot of Mexican realtors and and people in the Mexican community, my ears are so in tune to it. I'm constantly at parties and events and holiday parties it has it i'm like this uh-huh. is i like this stuff you know what i mean very similar last night i was just like man mexican party it's like <laughs> same thing beer 
Yeah. 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 I think like um, that's how it felt. Like there's really not that much difference. And I saw Mexican people actually there mm -hmm. in the crowd, and it was kind of like the music is so similar. It's damn. Who would have thought we all get down like that? Yeah, you know, it was fun. So, um, so we said, are you where are you from? Well, um, I was born and raised here in Chicago, in the north side of Chicago, by exactly by Pulaski and Fullerton around that area. Mm, okay, but. Um, my parents were born and raised in Durango, Mexico, and so they came to the U.S., um, and uh, um, my father, which is a whole other topic we need to talk about, um, You're good. he was uh, incarcerated for 15 years wow. um, because this is a reason why I, I believe in, in, in the immigration um, uh, even though my father did come to the United States illegally, I do believe that we should allow immigrants into the United States the right way because I am living proof of why when someone comes into a different country without a plan, this is some of the things that happen, which my father got himself involved into criminal activities mm. out of the desperateness to provide uh, to, for his family, and he didn't have a plan. A place to live and so people become desperate and um, and uh, the reason why I wanted to share this is because his decisions has have a lot to do with my traumas um, and so uh, also because I believe that we do need to have boundaries we can't just I believe in law and order and uh, yes my family my fa most of my families were immigrants, and it, mostly everybody here in the U.S. is an immigrant coming from different countries. But I do believe that there's supposed to be a process for this. And so um, my father's decisions did quite a bit to all, all my sisters. My, I have two, uh, older, an older sister, and I have a younger sister and an older brother. And we all did suffer the conf consequences. They may not share the same uh, opinion as me. Because we're very vocal <laughs> about this, but um, I guess we all see the outcome differently, right? And uh, um, so, after first of all, I when my father was incarcerated, I was not told he was incarcerated. We were told that he was in school oh, until, wow. so that was a big um, issue <coughs> growing up. Until I started to question things and I ask, you know, um, well, how come my school, like I go home? You know, I would ask my mom, and she tried her best to keep it from us. Not sure why, and I have actually have never questioned her about that. But um, uh, I think I started asking her when I was, like, around 10 years old, and that's where the Lizette um, questioning things started, the, rea the truth of things, truth started becoming important to me because I was so affected by the fact that my mother decided to keep that from me that my father was in jail so I remember you know when we would go to federal prison um, the head count before I, I remember it like a dream but now that I'm older it kind of it does affect me because I would watch as we would walk because once they do the head count they ask everybody other family members to leave and so I just remember it was a routine thing like we would go on Sundays or whenever someone could drive us out there to see my father in prison um, I remember I remember vividly carrying one of my uh, teddy bears with me, and I would walk out, and I would just look at my dad like everybody would stand up, and then I, I didn't know what they were doing. And then I would just see him look at me directly in my eyes, and um, I remember that vivid, vivid, vividly. And it's like a trauma that I, would, I will never forget because, because – um, uh, seeing your father uh, and you don't understand why there's this separation where he can't come home was traumatizing. It's hard for a kid yes. to, to That's rough. wrap their mind around mm -hmm. that to understand that. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's like, so how long, so how long did the, I guess, that kind of ruse continue? Like, how long was, like, your, your mother able to, like, kind of convince you guys before, like, 
like um dad's like going on like the longest uh postdoctoral study program in <laughs> patagonia studying the you know a rare endangered species of llama or something and it's like <laughs> you know like what <laughs> well, that's a <laughs> interesting example like, yeah. you know like <laughs> think of he's specific shit. yeah he's just like he's abroad he's doing a post uh, postgraduate doctoral study you know on the the, the endangered species of alpaca mm-hmm. or whatever you know it's like yeah how did you know what did what did she like uh how long was she able to pull that off for though? well it actually didn't come out from her because like they say truth always comes out oh. and it was actually one of my um cousins we were playing oh. And she was like, oh, you know, we got into an argument because she didn't want to share some toy with me. And I think I was like 10. And she's like, well, at least I have a dad and your dad's in jail. Ooh, that's and then oh. so that's harsh. Yeah. So then I just went up to my mom and I was crying. I wasn't crying because of what she told me because I didn't understand anything about being in jail or anything like that. Yeah. Right. So then I got up and I went crying to my mom because of the toy, not because of what she just told me. So then when I told my mom, my aunt was having they were in the kitchen and my aunt told my mom that it, I think it was time for her to tell us. Hmm. Oh. So that's when well, they had the conversation. Yeah, I'm sure that your mom did it from like a very wholesome, yes. you know, point of view. As a mom, I could yes. relate. Like, I know I've not said a lot of things mm-hmm. to my children in fear. You know, you just want to protect your children um, from everything. You know, if that means you know, not fully saying the truth on things you know that's something that you do as a mom but yeah there's a Mm -hmm. there's a time to kind of have those conversations but it's also like you know when family this is one thing that i i despise so much that family has these these adult conversations in front of their children Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happened your cousin told you out of spite and mm-hmm. parents and adults need to be very very conscious when they're having adult talk or about anything to not include their children or not have it while the kids are around you know so oh my god i'm so sorry that you went through that like, yeah that's well you know i I, I this is a reason why i believe and like, this is a big part of who lizette is now truth matters to me and it doesn't matter if it makes anybody else uncomfortable, right. what my truth is, I will always speak it because I know how it affects people. Yes. And I'd rather stand in truth and be by myself on that mm-hmm. truth than having, because you do hurt other people. You just don't know when you're, they're going to have out. that uh, yeah, yeah. Um, feeling of hurt, like uh, how, how it happened to me. And um, But as I'm an adult now, as I've figured out, as I, as I look back at my life, I don't blame anyone because that's where forgiveness comes in, right? Mm -hmm. I understand that there's things that happen in your life that need to happen. Like me, it made me a strong woman. It made me a strong person. I can survive. And this is just a 10% of what has happened, what I've survived um, of my life. But it's a big part of it because it's trauma. It's some, I will not, I can have everything in the world. I can become a millionaire. I can do whatever is like I can just achieve anything, but I will never have a relationship with my father. Hmm. So that's the only thing I will never have, and I had to let it go because it kept hurting me. The right. idea that I—that's something that I will never have. I want to ask you a few questions before we get too far, because there's a lot of things that we just touched on that you just touched on there. Who would you have rather heard? Um, about your father from your mom or your somebody else? I think it's the person that created the hurt that's responsible for saying it. And I think it was my father's, as a man, as the leader of our household, to have told us, you know what, this is the reason mm-hmm. why you guys are suffering, because of me. And he eventually did, but I understand him. You know, my father didn't go to school. He was a typical, you know, migrant worker. Like, he was working out in the fields, I understand him now, but back then I As had a, a lot of hurt. Yeah, you don't understand yes. those, you know, when you migrate to mm-hmm. another country, like you're starting from scrap. Yes. But you're also escaping what's happening in your native country that prompts you to leaving. So the less of two evils is coming to another country mm-hmm. to provide for your family, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah, like that's completely understandable and and thank god that you honestly were able to 
digest not digested mm-hmm. but understand it even as an adult because it's one thing with children um as a parent where i've gone through that myself too not specifically mm-hmm. that but you don't understand why your children you know they're they're not in a state where they could comprehend all these details mm-hmm. but later on as an adult you know it's a different story and that's really good that you're mm-hmm. that you're able to to understand at um empathize with your dad not and understand you know Mm -hmm. but you that doesn't mean that they're they're uh, taken off the hook either right speaking of empathy like i try to understand why people do certain things to try to like make sense of it to myself and so like i would think like why would somebody hide the truth from you or why would they lie to you and i think sometimes the sincere answer is that people aren't strong enough to tell you the truth um, sometimes people are weak and they're embarrassed of the truth and it, that, that overcomes them so much that they can't, they can't put it out in words. And I don't know that that's the case in your situation. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying in general, that's why I like to try to give people the benefit of the doubt because I know how hard certain things are to talk about. And, you know, um, it's, it takes, it takes a lot of courage and, and, and you've got to keep those muscles sharp, you know, and like me in my own life, I've always been kind of like honest to a fault. Um, you know, which doesn't serve me well in the real estate law business because like there's, if there's something wrong with the deal, you never want to scare the other side. So you have to constantly, ah, they're just waiting for a few more documents to make up some bullshit story or whatever. So, uh, but like me, my natural reaction is, look, this guy is a little iffy just so you know, like he might get approved. He might not. I'd rather shoot him straight. And then, oh my God, you're the, you're the bad guy later. If the loan gets denied, you've now led these people hunt for like a month or two. And then they're really upset later. So it's like, I don't know. It's just kicking the can down of the pain down the road. But uh, is your father still living? He is. He got deported to Mexico, and he lives in Durango, Mexico now. Mm-hmm. Do you still do you visit him? I do, but I still have some. I, I, I see. This is the thing with the beauty of life, right? Everyone's in their own process of growth, and my my father, unfortunately, hasn't reached that stage of having that conversation with me and understanding. And I still don't judge him for that. But I choose for my own mental health to not touch the topic anymore. I've moved on for my own mental health. I forgave him, but I don't have a relationship with him. Because it's it's me continue to reopen my wound. Mm-hmm. Like hoping I'm going to have a relationship with my father. And that's just not the case. So I rather, I have two children. I feel like, I, I believe in God. I believe that God has given me this burden to carry that grew me to help other people. And I, my dad had a chance in my life. His chance is gone. So I choose to give my energy to other people, to my children, to my mother that still needs me, to my, my siblings. So I've, I've given up on that. Do you feel like it would be a waste of time to to try to put your energy into a relationship with your father when you can spread that um, you can spread that love to other places. Yes. It's, it's much easier to do, right? It feels more natural than to just place your love and your energy um, in places where it'll be accepted very easily and, and not try to fight something that just didn't yeah, not work. because I want to respect his own growth. But mm-hmm. for my mental health, I need to stay where I'm at now until he hopefully grows to that a level of awareness where he can actually say you know what because he hasn't he has apologized but his to me right because like i said my sisters and my brothers see it in a different way because we all have different experiences but i feel like he hasn't he has said i'm sorry but his and maybe i don't know that maybe is his maybe it's the fact that he spent 15 years in jail and it's a whole different life in there you know i don't know that's why i don't judge him but I'm hurt. But like I said, for me, I need to stay away. Yeah. So you obviously the the chance to make a connection in childhood with your with your father is gone. That that will never change. The time is behind us. There's there's nothing you can do to change that fact. Um, but do you feel like you'll have a chance when the time is right? if he does have that growth or that maturity leap in his life to make a different kind of connection as an adult? I, I honestly feel like I there's a, a lot of things because of this situation that I've had to repair on my own. 
first of all, I had to become aware of it, that it was a problem. And then I had to spend like a good years of my life repairing those issues. So I feel like I've already given enough sac- f- to this. Yeah. I don't want to continue doing it. I, I, I'm, I really have to, for my own sake, for my children's sake, I had to re-focus um, my energy. So that's, I feel like I, I, I just, I need to stop. Yeah, I think part of like self-care, self-growth mm-hmm. is also accepting people where they're at and leaving it alone. You can't expect the same person that hurt you, that created trauma, to also repair you. We all want to seek like this closure. We always want, but you know, you can't continue to give that power to someone who has hurt you. Mm-hmm. That was one of, as an adult, that was one of the lessons that mm-hmm. I had to, with my father too, that I, that I had to overcome. Um, and it's hard sometimes to digest that. You know, because it does create a void in you um, because your father is a very, very important role in your life. So now you have to become that masculine in your own life. You have to show up as your own hero. And sorry, I don't try to get get emotional about that. Um, Uh, I get what you're saying, though. It's um, it's hard just because that's such an integral piece of time during which and you're saying you were 10 when that when that the revelation was made to you that oh holy smokes dad's dad's in jail and missing those those formative years with a parent is like this that's like part of your growth as an individual like what you were saying mm-hmm. is having the you know a father and, and and having that like sort of like just not applicable black hole in your formative years it's like the time for that formation, that relationship is like, like that's almost past. And like kind of what Brian said is like, could you almost do, you know, like maybe not so much. There's, there's almost no repairing that those filling in like substitute for those formative years. Cause that time has passed. Now you're looking at back in as an adult and you, you formed, you grew, you know, with that, with that black hole in your, in your, uh, the lack, that lack of having a figure during that time. So, um, it's almost like, I think you've got the right, the right angle with it honestly because there's no like trying to go back retroactively and fix that like time to fix that was then like the time to fix that was him to be present but he couldn't be because he was in jail and i guess you know maybe a little bit of devil's advocate for your father i i i think i understand like why they didn't want to tell you because you're just a young kid and honestly i i might have done the same thing if i if i had a little kid and you know my wife you know is back raising raising my child be like how do I explain this to a, t- you know, mm-hmm. like an eight, eight, nine, yeah. 10 year old? Like how, how will they even understand? Like, and what will it do to them? Like, will they be depressed all the time? Will they be sad all the time? Like maybe just, maybe they deserve better than the truth. You know, like they're just a little kid. And I, I think sometimes people do deserve better than the truth. Like, um, you know, it's just, it's just life happens that way. And, um, it's like, well, let's just have, you know, our daughter be happy and, you know, make her think her dad's off doing productive things. And, um, so I, I get kind of where he's coming from, but then when you can't keep a lid on it and then mm-hmm. the truth slips out, which it inevitably does eventually, then it all comes cascading down. So, but I, I do kind of, I think I understand where your dad was coming from. That is a tough sell to make to a little mm-hmm. kid. Like, Hey, your dad's in prison. You know, he made a mistake. And, um, and then you try to unpack that to like a, to a child is, is, is difficult as parents, I think. You know, I have all sorts of thoughts and feelings on, on a lot of what we just said here. And, and to back up and backtrack a little bit is what I see a lot is that once somebody has become the strong person that they are, they have overcome adversity or learned to deal with it in their life, that then they will have have this opportunity to establish a relationship where it's kind of like they'll never be really close, but it's like you still have a love for them and you've you've made mental peace with the the past and you have this different relationship now that can kind of open up new things going forward. And sometimes that's not possible, but I I see that more is where it's like, yeah, you know, mom was an alcoholic and she was abusive, but like now that she's older, like I'm past that and I become a strong person. Now we just at least talk or we, you know, we see each other, whatever the case may be. But what I've realized in my life recently, seeing my friends with kids or or seeing other people with kids is the importance of the parental relationship to have a good one. And one thing I find myself asking 
as a soon-to-be father is how honest to be with your children because one of my closest friends growing up, who you guys know well, and I'm not going to say his name on the podcast because I ain't no fucking rat bitch and I'm not going to put <laughs> people's dirty laundry out there and talk shit, yeah. but um, one of my closest friends, his dad was in prison when he was growing up as well, and they told him the truth, and I think his dad was like, his dad is a fucking man's man, just like my dad, just like your dad, and... um he wanted him to know from a young age like to harden him up like you know what life's fucked up you know and you know this is what happened and he he literally kind of told him the truth about the situation and he was i don't know my guess would be probably eight nine years old at the time or ten and um what i've found in my life is that the ability of children to listen and absorb what you're saying if you make it make sense to them, if you explain to them why you're telling this and like how you can feel about it and also how to manage it, like to, to right. tell your kids, like if you can give them this life hack of like, hey, this is not going to be a good thing. I'm going to be gone a lot and I really don't want to be and I know that's going to hurt. But I'll always be here. Come visit me. Come and see me. You know, um, when I get out, you know, we'll make up for the time and, you know, this was fucked up. I'm embarrassed of it. And I know this is going to be, it hurts, the thing that hurts me the most is that, that I won't be there for you, but I'll, I'll be there in other ways and just try to, I, I don't know, I feel like children are smarter than you give them credit for, and I found a flaw in my ways, is like, I remember I was working at Office Depot, and we were getting ready to, to for closing time, and there was these teenagers in there, and they were like young teenagers, I mean, I don't know, maybe they are like 11, 12 years old, 13, right? And I started kind of like talking to like my dad used to talk. Like he was very authoritarian. Like you do what I say, you fucking get in line, right? You move, you know, do do what the fuck I tell you to do. So I was telling these kids, I'm like, I'm like, grab whatever you're going to buy. And I'm like, buy it now. Or if you're not buying anything, you need to leave. I was like rude to them. When I could have literally talked to these kids and probably gotten a different result and said, hey guys, um, you know, uh, we're getting to the end here. Everybody's kind of tired. It's been a long day. We're, we're just trying to wrap up a story. Are you guys buying anything? or whatever and just been nice to them and reasoned with them instead it could have been embarrassing for each member of that group who was receiving that message because of the way i said it and they were talking shit to me after that. i'm like i'm a fucking young 20 something year old male arguing with some kids after they left the fucking store like outside the store i'm like it's a bad way for a situation to go but what i realized then is like most of the time if you explain to a kid truth and reason and allow them, give them the framework to how to deal with it, how they can deal with it, which would be probably not as good because of how they'll feel. And, like, you'll see, I'm telling you the truth um, when, when you go that route. But if you give them that, they're able to make sense of it and act on it. I feel much better than we give them credit for. Um, so although knowledge can make people grow up more quickly than you would hope they could, sometimes it's the best because I feel like dishonesty is a double wrong. Not only did you fuck up, but then you hurt hurt somebody by deceiving them o- about the reality of the situation. That's another, that's two wrongs, I feel, and two wrongs usually don't make a right. Anyway, I just dumped yeah. a whole bunch of stuff out there. So, thoughts? Yeah, I agree with that. That's exactly the parenting style or so that, that I chose with my children. As, as soon as they became of age or, like, and again, when you, when you well, to me, now that I'm aware, when you explain things to people, you got to consider the, their level of awareness. Yes. So, when I communicate to my children, I tell them, you know, wh- like you said, what I think they would understand. So, they know every detail and situation that I've been through, and I choose to tell them so they c- they themselves can grow from that. And um, and I had this last um, it's because it's just so much to say. <laughs> so th- this last uh, lecture that I had with my youngest, because I have two boys, I was a teen mom, which also my my father not being there contributed to my life decisions mm. when I was making unconsciously. Um, but um. So I have two boys. One is going to be 20 in February. The youngest is 14. And um, I had chose to move my youngest to a private school because I wanted him to, you know, to go to a better school. But last year in eighth grade, he told me, Mom, I want to go to a regular school. And I said, why? And he was like, because it kind of doesn't feel real. So I wanted to, what do you, th- what do you think real is? And he was like, I feel like they're different. And I said, well, different is good. Explain what you mean. And so I told him, I told him, okay, um, 
I told him the truth about both realities, and I said, what would you like to choose? I told him, you know, in Chicago public schools, you're going to be seeing fights all the time. You know, the, the education is not the same. And then he told me, but I feel like that's not preparing me for real life. And so I was like, okay. I said, so, so then what school do you want to go to? So he belonged, we belong to the Steinman's, um, um district. So I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you to make this decision on your own because I told you. And so I've, I've noticed my youngest son, my oldest son, they did grow up faster. But the truth is, like I've always told my, my children, life is not fair. Mm-hmm. L- life is ugly sometimes. And life will be ugly to good people. Life will be ugly to good and b- bad people. So our, and this is where resilience comes in, you know, our, us as human beings, we need to accept that truth that life is not, sometimes it's horrible. And we need to pick up quickly and move on. And that's basically the definition of what resilience is, is to get through the toughness quickly. Because right if you sit there, it's going to be very ugly, you know. And that's what I try to teach my, my kids. Now, with the masculinity part of it, it's so difficult because when I became aware about all my trauma, which was right after COVID, I had a shock of like all the trauma that I've gone through and I never had a chance to heal any of it because I was always just to, on to the next, on to the yeah. next. And I realized that and I was just like, whoa, this is a big load. And I was like, this is a heavy load. And I just kind of went crazy. Like, I went like, okay, how do I... I had a panic attack because I was like, man, I oh, really got to sit down and fix every problem that now arose because of all these other issues. And the masculinity was a big one. I realizing that because of all the male, the lack of male um, 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 presence, presence in my life, or something like that. beginning with my father, I became the male role. And I was like, I didn't even know I was in masculine energy because, you know, masculine energy overpowers feminine energy because that's what leadership is. It's the masculine role is leadership. It, both they both you cannot so when I realized that I was like oh shit like I have been in this position all my life I don't even know how to be feminine and <laughs> maybe wow. to yeah. explain That's to wild. some listeners out there because you know people are formulating their thoughts and opinions while they listen to us talk what you're saying is not that women can't be leaders it's just that the way it feels in and your observation you is, that, is that Le- um, leading and making decisions and making calls and like running a structured thing, it tends to entail more masculine qualities, assertiveness, assertiveness yes. and yes. things yes. like that, yeah. which can come off differently when when women are doing it, um, just because of like what we perceive, right? Like the, when we look at something, so when we look at a person. Yeah. So I wanted to like uh, add to that, like there's toxic masculine energy, yeah, yeah. and then yeah. there's where masculine does it energy. <laughs> Where's the line? Right? So, yes. right. So Good being point. assertive so, so. is a masculine, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem when um, we don't heal our inner child or um, childhood trauma is we become toxic masculine uh, energy as women uh, where we're grinding through the shit just to get it done. You know what I mean? And we don't have grace to ourselves. We don't take care of ourselves as women. That's where that toxic mm-hmm. masculine energy comes from. So masculine energy isn't bad, <laughs> for the mm-hmm. record. It's definitely not. No, but it's I feel not. like what you do with it is is is, right. is the bad thing or the good thing. Like, it's good to be strong if you're a protector. Right. It's not good to be strong if you're using that physical strength advantage to beat your wife or to <laughs> exactly. or to right. be abusive to other people or to use the fear of abuse Mm -hmm. to manipulate people and get certain outcomes and results. That's to me, toxic Mm -hmm. masculinity, but, but showing like, but just the general everyday things that that people do exercise, discipline, routines, showing somebody, this is how you use this tool. So you could Mm -hmm. do it next time, showing them independence. I believe that's positive masculinity. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's what you need to channel um, masculine energy into is things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, Anyway, that's that's I guess all I have to say about that at the moment. But good for pointing it out that there's 
different kinds of masculine injuries. Some are some is good and some is bad. Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting that COVID was a real like reboot for mm-hmm. our national psychology, wasn't it? You know, it hasn't yeah. been fully rebooted, or if it has, <laughs> it's, it's not back. It's in a bad reboot. It's different. Yeah, it's it it, it, it we have put everything off kilter, kilter, and you feel every realizations like you had, like mm-hmm. holy smokes, like you almost like a existential like realization of like wow, I've been I've been like the mission mindset my entire life, mm-hmm. and you know I've just been. I've been just getting after it and haven't taken hardly had a chance to take pause and like evaluate like where I'm at and like what led me to here. Now that I have some time during this pandemic, I see this. People had that too with their jobs. They're like they reevaluated what, what what they want to do and what their priorities were too. Just you know with their livelihoods and whatnot. And it's been an interesting thing. Um, just and I don't know. I mean, in some aspects, that's good that, that people got kind of like a pause button. You know, things aren't pausing like. Hmm, you know, I never thought of holy smokes. I've been the doing this my whole life. Mm-hmm. Of COVID. Yeah. Yes. So that's kinda good that it had like sort of a um psychological reboot mm-hmm. for a lot of people. Um so you, you really had never had a chance to just defrag your hard your hard drive, you know, it was just yeah, because we were all forced to stop where we were at. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't. I, I was forced to, and that's a you know. I guess it's all about perspective, right? Because a lot of people died during COVID, yeah. but for me, it was a blessing because because of that, I literally sat down just like how I took notes, and I wrote everything down, and then from there it allowed me to feel compassion for my father, for everyone that was a part of my hurt. And then I realized how hurt I was and that I never stopped to heal myself. Mm -hmm. But from that, from me drawing it, came healing. From me being aware of the hurt came healing. And then it started making me feel good about myself that, damn, like, who the hell goes through all this stuff? And, like, I'm still a good person. I still fight for truth. And, like, that made me feel so good about myself. And that despite everything that I've gone through, I still been able to survive on my own to do what I think is true or right right and mm-hmm. my kids are doing good we're all healthy so I was feeling good about it I mean Gosh. but still just just acknowledging it I really I was just it was it was a, a hard realization to go through to recap what you said yeah. during COVID it, it seemed like it kind of hit you all at once about a lot of things from your past mm-hmm. You stopped and kind of absorbed those feelings for a while, and and thought about how you felt about them. Mm-hmm. And then you took action in a different direction. So, do you feel like this was a big period of change for you, like a very significant change in your life? Well, uh, after right after I had that, I had I wanted to feel like something else. I wanted I had to feel like a because that was so that feeling was so awful that I wanted to feel something else besides that, you know, the adrenaline rush that we talked about yesterday. So I had already bought my motorcycle and that day I just didn't want to feel anything. So I went, I smoked some weed. I, 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 I had like two shots of something and I got on my bike and that was the first time I went like, and one of my friends told me, Oh, are you sure you weren't subconsciously trying to commit suicide? I said, no, I said, I wanted to feel something so much stronger than what I was feeling because it was so tough to realize that I just wanted to pause it and then just feel such adrenaline rush and then I felt good after like all my life I've had to figure out ways like those were my pauses I had to figure out ways to control my mind and like letting it go into something else so I had to have and it was just something that I now think that it was God guiding me through this. I mean, he wasn't telling me to smoke weed, right? He lets you decide. <laughs> he lets you decide. God probably smokes weed, too. But I mean, yeah. he created it. He or, <laughs> but, she created it. he or she created it. How do you think it all but, came to be, right? Yeah. But what I'm saying is that he was guiding me through, like, okay, let's say I know this was extreme. like, so. But that was what I decided because there's other times where I've gone running, you know, to, 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 to stop that. And I would cry and run. You know. God, running so healthy for the mind and the body. I mean, not so much your knee joints if you're running on very hard concrete, <laughs> but it's yeah, like it it's around. super therapeutic. Um, so, so what what were some of the ways that that you dealt with these things since you had your motorcycle freedom ride? Like you just felt so fucking free and exhilarated, and just felt the energy of what you were doing, the physical energy. 
what have you been doing differently in your life now? Well, well, that's what I wanted to talk about. Some of the things that I deal with, like becoming resilient, is that you, uh, for me, I need to see something tangible. Because I can't just be waiting for hoping for something. So then for me, that ta- that was tangible. Like the immediate feeling of like, oh, like I'm feeling something else. Whether And that's why I feel like people start to use drugs because they want an immediate feeling mm-hmm. of happiness, an immediate. And so I had to realize is that you, this is crazy. You can't do this all the time. Yes. <laughs> so first of all, it's very dangerous. <laughs> so then from there, I just I started to journal more. I started to, like, I went to Walgreens and I bought post-its. And I wrote all my trauma on the wall. Like, I posted it on the wall. Because I needed to look at it and confront it. And it couldn't just be in my spirit anymore and in my mind. So I would walk into my house and I would look at my trauma. (laughs) Visually. So then, um, and then afterwards I just started to, it started to make me feel good about how strong I am. So my sh- my mind shifted to to realizing that damn that's some fucked up ass shit you went through, like but you're still here and you don't realize through that entire journey mm-hmm. that you are a chingona you mm-hmm. are resilient you are this goddess you don't realize it until you start having all these downloads it seems like you had a download and yeah. epiphany like oh my god yeah. like and I think everyone as an adult when you're facing when you finally get to that point like man I need to make some changes. Mm-hmm. And you start kicking, you start purging. I call it the purging. You're purging friends. You're purging everything that doesn't align to your higher self. It no longer feels good, you know. And you just start moving along and you you start blossoming. I think physically, you even start changing without knowing because that old toxic energy is no longer in your system. So you're not attaching to low vibrational things, you know. You start elevating, and now all of a sudden you start seeing beauty Mm -hmm. in everything that you're doing, (laughs) or at least attaching to the beauty of things. But remember, as a mom, well, as a single mom, right, you also got to worry about what your children are thinking about how you're going through your mental. Mm -hmm. So not not only can't you just freely, like... Uh, like go through this you I had to think about how am I going to explain this to my son because my oldest son he doesn't live with me anymore he became very independent like he just moved out he got a job he's going to college uh, and my little one he's really the only one I'm responsible for now so um, he I had to explain to him why do I have post-its on the wall <laughs> <laughs> and I told him look because he's seen me crying he's seen me and like I said I tell him the truth he knows I mean he knows people are dying from COVID he knows like and I told him look I've always tried to guide him as much as I possibly could so you can't just go into this whole full blown and that you also gotta worry about mm-hmm. who's watching you what kind of example you're yeah. setting as to yeah. are you dealing with your coping yes. um, in a responsible way mm-hmm. because like you said with drug use and things there are some very irresponsible ways to do it mm-hmm. um, but I think everything you said really in highlights the importance of externalizing your problems outside of yourself um, you know it's weird because we don't think of thoughts as having weight but they are very heavy fucking things mm-hmm. and so you could be carrying all, all around all that baggage with you and constantly having to be doing that mental work so it sounds like you know, externalizing the, neg- the those negative things and putting them in writing and putting them out there on the wall allowed you to confront the enemy outside and keep your like your body and your mind clean and have it be a sanctuary and externalize that bullshit and get it out. Like I think going forward after COVID and all the fucking side effects of the the pandemic on people mentally, we're really gonna have to be focusing on healing going forward um, and dealing with mental problems. Um, it's a really crazy world that we live in. Like, man, I talked about earlier is that capitalism is a very good system, but it has a lot of bad side effects too. And one of those things is if there's not profit in it, people aren't going to do it, right? So you have counselors right now. There's this thing called Better Help. You can go online and get a therapist. I've heard mixed things about it, yeah, but talking too. about your problems is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, but. They don't. If there was more money in giving people a framework with how to deal with their problems, like people would be doing it all the fucking time, right? I mean, yeah, there's coaching out there and stuff. We know a good one, right? You know, shout out to Kimmy Larson, Zen Boutique Life Coaching. Um, but you know, if there's not a major profit in it, then it doesn't get pursued in society. Exactly. And so, 
we I believe that we need to do stuff like we're doing right now, have these conversations to better our collective framework of how to deal with problems, how to get along with each other in society, especially after everything we've been through. Yeah, so so that part of my life um, is the end, right? When I figured out that realization. But previously to that was a lot of things that I left in between. You know, domestic violence, teen pregnancy, like my mom was dying. So a lot of things happened that led to that, which... I don't know what you guys want to pick and choose what I should talk about. We're doing beautiful work right now. We we like we like it all because it's. I think a lot of people see you as success, but we don't know. People don't really see all of the story before the success hits. All the trials and tribulations, and all of the cuckoos you had to Mm -hmm. overcome, um, all of the adversity and. You know, it's very important, even as a teen mom, like all you have to deal with being a teen. Plus, now you're a mom. Mm -hmm. So you have to put yourself in different shoes and elevate yourself and all these growing spurts along the way. So it's amazing to to see that, to hear hear your story. So so to me, the definition of success means it's not something monetary Mm -hmm. to me is being able to to conquer all of this. And because it, how it transfers over into society and how, it, how I feel so confident that I've learned every skill possible to become resilient. Um, and, and as far as like um, leadership skills, um, um, skills in general that you need in business, like I can transfer that into any, you can, um, yes. um, any field I want to be in. And that's why right now I really want to get into law enforcement because I feel like everything that I've gone through I can share it with others and I know there's I just I feel like there's a huge need in law enforcement and I need to get in you know that's admirable because especially in this city right now it's a tough spot to be in to be a cop it's a terrible place hearing. to be in right now so you, think about you got a cop at this time, you know the way the police are being treated and the way the leadership are being in the city with the mayor mm-hmm. and the relationship they have with the police and I guess the relationship the citizenry has with the police just in general in America you know, is is dicey depending on who you talk to. Um, you know, and it's so my hat's off to you for jumping into it now in this hour of need. And this is really, you know, um, the time the time that they, I think they need probably more in law enforcement because from what what I've been hearing, it's it's tough even out there right now with you know the restrictions placed upon them and how they can actually enforce the law, what they're allowed to pursue, what they're not. I I think we talked about it before where they can't really do. You have a uh, someone you know who's a cop was saying like we can't no even chase do, orders. No, we can't even chase. I don't want to talk about it on the podcast it's, because I don't want people to get the impression that like you can commit a crime and get away yeah, with it without being true. pursued. Yeah, it's it's a tough thing because um, you know you you out the, you come in and with seems like you have all the right tools and the right mindset to succeed in a job like that, but on top of that, you're going to be hampered by your own leadership in the city mm-hmm. probably, and not to mention just. This is this is not like it's a you know Janesville Wisconsin where I'm from. This is a whole different animal. Like the crime in the city is in a different level. The caliber of criminal you're going to encounter <coughs> is on a different level. So, like I said, my hats off to you for for diving into that because it, it's a it's a tough tough job to be a cop nowadays. Um, tough job to be a cop is okay. any days mm-hmm. like just because it's not just the the violence. It's you're going to be first on the scene. You're going to be, for, for accidents, you're going to be first on the scene. People horrifically mangled, decapitated in accidents and stuff. Like, it's going to be a lot of hairy stuff you're going to see. And I think this is maybe a segue into what we can talk about later with uh, uh, suicide prevention and whatnot. But in terms of resiliency, going to need a lot of it, I think, in this job. So um, Another thing, another R word that I think we need with policing probably in general but in chicago specifically is reinventing Mm -hmm. we need to reinvent renew and reinvigorate because that kind of ties in with some of the stuff that i mentioned earlier about Mm -hmm. the way you talk to people like what role um the police can have is really up to us and it's up to leadership right it's like you there's the old saying you know officer friendly like it's kind of what we need to return to um, we need a connection 
between a strong connection between police and the people that they serve um an actual relationship as opposed to just an authoritarian figure that shows up um and and matt mentioned earlier is that like you're dealing with somebody who is gathering evidence of a crime against you and that creates fear and anxiety in people that's their response right yeah. so your your interactions with the police are always going to be stressful even if the other person is 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 nice right but what i would like to see what i believe can be achieved is building a connection between police and the community in a way that inspires confidence in people to work along with police to interact with them and to, to, to learn and grow together in the community and to, to effectuate change where instead of choosing a, a crime or not telling the police, you're helping to make sure that your streets are what you want them to be. They're the streets that you want to be in, that you're, you want to raise your kids in. Um, and, you know, I guess the, the question is, how do you do that? Well, yeah, whatever's happening right now is not the answer. It's, mm-hmm. it's not the way. It's failing. Um we have we have a shortage of police officers they're being recruited um by other suburbs by other cities by other mm-hmm. states to take our trained officers and put them somewhere else we are going to face a deficit a crisis uh deficit where we don't have trained professionals in the fields that we need them in if this kind of shit continues if policing is not reinvented um it's also we're going to run into that in the medical field as well because there's a lot of doctors that are people are not either going into the medical field yep. or who are getting out of it so what yep. what we want there's always going to be black sheep and there's going to be problems what we want is that the problem police officers are like a fraction of the force they're just deceptive they've somehow made it in they have a they're egomaniacs or fucking sociopaths or psychopaths and they are wearing a badge and they are literally a wolf hiding in, in plain sight and sheep's closing. Those are the fucking people we they don't want in the ranks of the police. Yeah. So whatever we need to do to keep those people weeded out, we need to do it. Controversial opinion on that. Police unions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on the record as as like just conceptually, academically, I know, I know like functionally like how it came to be, but... Good luck doing that with police unions in place and not not drastically reforming police unions and, and getting the, the bad seeds out because, you know, it's it's a weird thing to me to have a public sector union because it almost it almost takes away sort of a the the accountability flow between the public and the public servants where there's a union that can essentially kind of sort of hold call the shots that it's divorced from divorced from the public itself so it's it's kind of like a thing to me where it's like i get why they exist but functionally you know when they when they have so much influence and, and your elected representative can only do so much to, with a police union i mean they're they're segmented and immune to the public's ability to actually do the reforms they want by who they elect because there's the protection of the union against them but at the same time you also want to have protections for your public servants so it's a very tough balance to strike between what, what i think the problem that you might be yeah. alluding to is that having a union involved almost creates some kind of like business relationship where it's it's, it's yeah. a profit driven thing or it's um <clears throat> pardon me that there's other kind of perverse incentives that get involved when there's when there's a union involved i ultimately like as we just talked this out loud i think i would fall on the side of let the officers the rank and file choose if they want a union or not and i think that although i agree with everything you said there there's there's some there's some issues involved when there's a union involved but they also need that protection from you do. the very thing they're going through right now you got a fucking chief of police no disrespect to that guy but doesn't show a lot of emotion and passion about his job when he speaks to the public He's, he's very matter-of-fact, and there's a place for that. But I believe that's more for, like, talking out decisions in a boardroom. Um, yeah. When I'm trying to inspire confidence or passion within within my people, you got a guy who's a controversial here, a controversial in Chicago, whatever the fuck that means. Hmm. Like, I think he supported Trump. He waves a flag. Um, Dan, something Cotton Zaro is the guy's name, but he's the head of the police union here. 
But if the mayor is not going to have the side of the rank and file, somebody has to. That's yeah. the thing. Uh, that's the problem with not having, you know, union. You really do. As police officers, you need a union to back you up with all of your benefits. If you get injured on the job, you think the city is going to go ahead and pay you out as an officer? Absolutely not. That is the reason why we need the unions in there. But we also need to do more for um, our police officers, our firemen, and everyone in in charge of um, putting law in order because there's not a lot of things that are being done for mental awareness. Mm-hmm. The suicide rates are sky sky high, um, and there's not you know there's no alternative. You know, hey, go to a psycho th- uh, a, a therapist or get some pills and and just put a little band aid on the problem. The issues that are having, and I feel like as adults, doesn't matter what you are, you're dealing with childhood trauma that's manifesting as an adult. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of these officers are getting triggered because they've experienced a lot of these things in their, you know, childhood. And if we're not actively pursuing alternative um, self-care for these policemen, of course, things will happen like the little bad apples. Not Mm -hmm. little, they're big. (laughs) The major bad apples. But even the officers that are taking the day-to-day calls that have to deal with all this trauma, they go home traumatized as well. They go home, you know, and it's not like they're doing anything for these police officers when they see these bodies that are, you know, overkills and children that are dead. Ultimately, they come home to their families and they have to digest all of this and then turn a switch that you're a parent or a husband and wife. The divorce rate is also significantly high for military police officers because there's not that mental, um, there's nothing in between. And not everyone really wants to go to a therapist that doesn't really understand them or is just quick to prescribe things like you really have to dig deep do self-care um getting you know and it's not that easy we're we don't have this push for healing at all it's just do this or do that and take a pill get a prescription and that's it and that's not the answer to everything like we need to make sure that if our police officers are answering um a domestic violence you know call those are one of the most dangerous that that there is out there and if you arrive on the scene and someone's you know killed you need a few days to yourself don't put these officers back in you know back at work the next day you can't mm-hmm. and then you expect them to have these regular traffic you know um, calls mm-hmm. and then you know, of course, they're triggered from what happened two, three days ago, and it just keeps building, building, building. And of course, you're going to have like angry police officers, you know, responding to simple things because they've been going through things for such a long time. And you have the veterans that are taking the, the tough and to your point right now. The tough thing for police has got to be the repetitiveness, pre- repetitiveness <laughs> of their job. So like our, our one of our close friends is a is a a firefighter in Berwyn and he was telling me about some of the horrific things he sees or constantly having to show up and literally revive somebody who is overdosed multiple times in the same week um that's a lot of mental weight to carry you can't unsee things and um you get jaded having to deal with the same problems right it wears on you over time and I think some people everyone's different you can only take some people can only take that too much I think some people stay in it too long Mm -hmm. when they should have maybe gotten out and found employment elsewhere. But some people, they're they're mentally calibrated to the point where they can take that. It doesn't phase them. But other people, like, right. if you see it long enough, like, it, it will kind of break you in a certain certain aspect. So... And I think... And when is that point? I don't know. How do you I I know it's that? tough. Yeah. There's, it, it's, it's very hard to put a, a finger on when that point is. And to be honest with you, I would think, just if I had to guess, the majority of the people are the ones who don't deal with it well. Like, you'll have some people who are just yeah. smooth operators. Like, like you get, a, like, some kind of Navy SEAL or, like, Marine who's, like, killing is my job. And that, yeah, yeah, I go to work at 9 in the morning, and then when I come home at 5, you know, and they, they're able to, they just, they have a, a way of coping with things that not everybody has. Or it just rolls right off them, like, mentally. It's just, like, just... But eventually that it's creeps crazy. back up. And that creeps back up in the relationships that you have within your family dynamic, you know, not being able to empathize with your partner. So that's why, like, you know, divorce rates and all these 
things that, you know, our mm-hmm. servicemen and women go through because they're not, there's no advocacy for taking care of yourself. You know? And then remember, oh. this works when the person is self-aware. Right. A mm-hmm. lot of people don't know Are why they're self-aware. triggered. They don't right. know. And they're just working on the in, the, in the time of your life where you don't know that you don't know. Exactly. And then if there's, you know, trauma piled up, plus the trauma from work, and then you don't understand why things are happening at home. A lot of these individuals, a lot of people are not self-aware. Exactly. It's something that we don't teach. It's something that, that I believe is part of uh, a, 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 a spiritual experience. It is. So I always say, like, and I don't know if you feel, you guys ah, feel the same way, but, like, uh, the things that I've gone through with my family as a child, um, I feel like it was a wake-up call. My parents didn't have the tools that I have, and now we have all these tools. But even planting seeds with our friends, like opening up the dialect of like, hey, how do certain situations make you feel when they're angry and triggered? Asking them, well, what, where do you think that stems from? And sometimes people are not open and receptive to like counseling mm-hmm. because it's not, you know, it's you're not a chingona or a chingona mm-hmm. if you don't get help that you need or you're immediately, you know, targeted as like someone that's crazy. But opening up that self-aware, like we need to become more self-aware and there needs to be more advocacy for that. Oh, for sure. Honestly, a lot more. <laughs> um, It should be required as a mandatory job yes. requirement as one of your duties. This is your job responsibility for, you know, two or three hours or whatever it may be on a given day of the week that you are going in there whether you like it or not and you're going to talk to somebody like yeah why is yeah. this an afterthought like, they should have and it's got to be early i believe in and, and, and it's got to be from the start of a police officer's career because like what you get is mm-hmm. some of these like i'll give you an example my brother-in-law he's not a police officer but he got injured on the job and he's like i didn't want to go to the doctor because you know men tough it up and they Mm-hmm. Don't go to the doctor. I'm like, yeah, oh, some of them kid. also lose their fucking eye because they end up getting an infection from an injury they had. Mm-hmm. And yeah. they don't have a fucking eye for the rest of their life. That doesn't sound very smart to me, does it, right? So I feel like if you let it go too long before you start putting somebody into treatment or requiring it, right? at that point they're already, uh, I, I know how to, to deal with policy. that. It needs to be policy. Yes, it, it has to it be policy. It needs to be policy. The unions need to advocate for that. And I feel like the top tier for unions to do is like making sure that everyone has high paying jobs, um, PTO time, vacation time, and all these perks along the way, but caring for them as well mentally, um, making sure that gym memberships are paid by your employer like that it should be part of the package making sure that you're able to have alternative treatments as part of your package that should oh i think any job should have but more so in jobs that you know like police officers that have to deal with a bu- generational trauma neighborhoods you know that are rougher than others you know you're dealing also with people that are not aware mm-hmm. their parents weren't aware and it's just generations on top of generations and how do you help your community and need it needs to stem from like different parts but mainly for police officers that have to deal with that yeah. and see like this is the thing we can sit here and speculate and throw theories and stuff but we don't really know what's going on until you're in yeah and that's the reason why i feel so passionate about i need to get into law enforcement because I feel like I am so driven to figure out what it is. I'm sure it's multiple things. Right. That um, what I do now, I I, I love it because I I love motivating people. I love helping people reach their goals, and and um, I I I give driving lessons to students from different countries that come into the U.S. primarily, and um and I love doing that because I love. To, to see how different people learn, different types mm-hmm. of learning. And then once they get there, I'm basically motivating them and teaching them a skill. And then the biggest vision that they don't see at the end, which I just started recording, was that the train of thought that got them to, first of all, start the lessons, then um, remove the fear of driving. Mm-hmm. It's all personal growth. But when I explain it to them, then they're able to bring that skill because it's a skill to anything else in their life. Right. So that's nothing in comparison to law enforcement because I get, you know, the praises and the pictures and the, oh, my God, thank you. But in policing is the opposite. 
Yeah, I'm probably they're going to spit at me, you yeah. know, and I'm ready for that. I'm ready for it because I feel that I need to find out what is happening in law enforcement. And I feel like God has prepared me, which we haven't talked about everything else, for such a time as this to get in. Because once I started the process, I started realizing when I, st- I started keeping a journal uh, of how I feel like the whole entire process is and how it's really, uh, it's just, I know that this is it. Like, I need to be here. It's just confirmation after confirmation. And, um, and I'm excited for this journey. I know what's ahead. I'm willing to sacrifice for it. And I did get a little example. I did. I was telling Brian that when we did the uh, walk for a uh, police uh, um, um, awareness for suicide, mm-hmm. which was last weekend. We did a. Well, not. I didn't complete the entire thing because it was physically impossible. It was an eight mile walk hmm. to every district, police district. That's crazy. And the organizer was Robert, and he's um, he's the one that actually completed the entire thing because he's done this for three years. Um, the first one he ran. But, you know, have him come in here and talk on yes, the podcast. One day. Yeah. I will. I will tell him. And so the second the, the he's been just walking the, the rest of them. And so I participated with him. I was only able to do about 34 hours. And this is continuous walking. And um, for the first time, I was able to experience the hate. And I it, it, it really awoken me to the fact that this is what I'm stepping into. And it was just because I was carrying a flag. Imagine what the flag uniform. Were you so I was carrying. Okay, so it was uh, four of us because you know, as people got tired, they would you know leave and uh, new ones would come in. So I, uh, it was four people. It was um, walking, including Robert, and they were holding the policing. We would switch off on the flags. They were holding the policing. Uh, some of them were Chicago Police, uh, FOP, Fraternal Order of Police, and then That's I was the police union. Area. Yeah, I was carrying the 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 uh, suicide awareness flag, and. Um, I, 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 I couldn't believe that so a lot of these people they didn't know who I was they didn't know my life they didn't know who I am and who Lizette is but because I was because I was part of this group that has this tension right or this negative uh, image I was being judged for it too and you know and then I and so I knew in in spiritually um it was the same sacrifice, however you guys used to believe that Jesus was, right? Um, when he was walking down saying he was the son of God. And that was the image that he was giving me that, that you know what, this is the same sacrifice you're going to be doing. Knowing that they hate you. But I feel like I'm ready to get in because I care about the officers and the community and and just being the best Lizette that I can be according to what I've developed through my hurt and my pain that I can help other people and I don't care if I'm going to be spit at and I don't care if people are going to are going to um, treat me a certain way because I have grown such tough skin that I know how to handle it and I can say that all I want now right because that's mm-hmm. what we can say but till I'm in it but I want to get in because of that you know that that reminds me um yeah honestly I think you got that the absolute right mindset going into that, and law enforcement can, you could use more people, you know, that have the same mindset going into it as well. Because I think that's exactly what they need to be looking at is like, how can I help the community? And right. I think it, when you stay in it a while, you can be jaded. As we talked, you see so much traumatic stuff, or um, and it's hard to to maintain that. And I think like on the on the topic of resiliency, like just going through, you know, you're kind of going into the storm. So like, face strong face strong, steal your will, straight into the maelstrom. Um, and I think that, like, what what was, in terms of, like, my mental process for, like, overcoming very difficult tasks, um, I kind of had, like, a realization sort of, like, when I was, like, studying for the bar exam, you know, because I was, that was difficult. I have trouble memorizing stuff. I have to really just, like, hammer down, hammer down, hammer down, hammer down uh, stuff to, you know, just get in, into my head to make it stick. And um, I've always, I've never been the greatest student, even though I have a law degree. Uh, like, I probably should have been like a fireman or something. Maybe more like grades <laughs> necessarily don't reflect yeah. your, your intelligence. Mm-hmm. But exactly, and all it is is um, 
what I realized is how I feel about something. Like I never liked school. I never liked academics so much. I'm nerdy on some things, but I'm not like a huge bookworm that just loves being in school and loves being in the classroom. But what I kind of realized is that um, how I feel about something does not affect my ability to do something. I think once I became aware of that, it's it's sort of kind of like saying, you know what? Because um, I, I, I should have learned this back in like cross country I ran cross country as a kid but I didn't learn it I, I until later in life I remember getting up you know uh for these meets and you'd be in a meet it'd be cold it'd be like you know in the fall and you know Wisconsin is still cold like in the fall in the autumn stuff and, you, and you're like like shivering and like you're running you're running clothes like ready to you, you really don't want to be there like <laughs> like this sucks I'm going to be running, you know, as hard as I can for, you know, a, a 5K basically across hills, across crappy terrain. It's going to be miserable. And uh, people are going to be elbowing you. And I'm like, I just know it. It's, it. People are going to like whipping flags in your face as they turn a corner. People do shady shit like that in cross country of all sports. It's, it's comical. Yeah. But um, as I, I do not want to be here. However, that did not affect my ability to run mm-hmm. at all. How I felt about it does not affect my ability. Like, I'm still... I'm it's like, you know what? I'm fast. I'm conditioned. And then I realized that, like, during when I was studying for the bar exam, and I do that in the military also, we have a tough task ahead of us. You know, um, you're tired. You don't want to do it. Um, however, if you just realize, wait, no, I, I still have the ability to do this. Like, it, it doesn't matter. Like, it's basically like, fuck my own feelings it, it, it is, you know, kind of how I approach it. Uh, oh, I don't want to work out. Oh, I don't want to study today. You know, it, and I kept waiting. What kind of thing? I, what kind of held me back in life? You know, my my dad, God bless him, is a great parent. Actually, I, I have fantastic parents. Um, so I'm, I'm blessed in that regard. But he would be like, "Get motivated. Just you, you need to get motivated. Motivation just does not occur. Some people are naturally, you know, just naturally like hua hua rah rah, you know. Um, but even if you are not, which I'm not, I'm not like a you know super like go getter or anything. Like, I, I kept waiting to, like, be motivated about something, but it, it never occurred. And I was like, and, and I'm like, I'm never going to be motivated to, like, study for the bar exam, like, sit down for eight hours a day and just, like, go through lectures, crank out note cards, go through lectures, do practice quizzes. I was never going to be motivated to do that. I had to realize that that motivation was never going to occur. I simply had to just do something. Like, it's, even though you dislike it, I think that's resiliency is doing something regardless of how you feel about it. Just actually overriding your own like mental constraints about how you feel about you have like your natural instincts oh i don't want to do this Mm -hmm. i'm tired i don't feel up to it i don't feel motivated does not affect your ability to do it like hey i still have a pretty good mental capacity um i know if i just download this information in my brain i can do this even if i hate it so and that's my long rambling way of saying that basically you know fuck your own feelings you can still do it. And that's what I tell, you know, people who come to me about, oh, I, th- I think I should go in the military. Like, what, what what should I know coming in? I'll be like, your feelings about doing something do not affect your ability to do it. Even if you're, you're fucking tired, scared, you know, it's all just a mental constraint. It does not actually affect your... Now, if you don't have... If you're missing a limb, obviously you're not going to be a cross-country mm-hmm. star. Like, right. <laughs> unless you're that Blade Runner guy, you have, like, some blades on your legs. Anyways, um, who didn't he kill his girlfriend or something? But anyway, that's for another <laughs> podcast. But, <laughs> you know, so it's just, like, just overriding your own your own feelings about something is super important. And and once you come to that realization, because just because just you kind of think how you feel about something is just you know it can be so it can hold you back so much um and just pushing that override button and going through it anyways and almost not even thinking about it did you like did you i I find like the way to like hijack motivation is like developing your reason why yeah like if money was not a thing what would you be doing you Mm -hmm. know and if that aligns with something that you have to overcome that becomes your motivator you know um that becomes your motivator so you know that you have to crush this one obstacle in order to get to your goal so having those and monitoring yourself consistently like 
Are my goals changing? You know what I mean? Do I need to pivot? Learning how to pivot during adversity that's tied into like resiliency, like learning how to recover quickly. But if you don't have that, um, if you haven't learned that skill to recover quickly, it's really hard for you when you go through moments of adversity, like, fuck, you know, what am I supposed to do? You have to stay true to yourself, like meditate a little bit, stay within those feelings, don't completely brush them off, stay within them, and then recover right back mm-hmm. and get back on it. So just because something happens small, you could just... Yeah, and you mentioned meditation is like a framework for... Meditation, prayer. Yeah, whatever, it may be running, um, exercise, um, yoga, um, frameworks of things that can help you deal with things. Um, you know, I feel like I, you know, procrastination is a lot of the times because of the way you feel about something. Oh, yes. And you know what? There's not, sometimes procrastinating something is just choosing not to carry a weight at a given time, which is overall better for your current things that you got to do. Like when you know that there's like, you do have a problem to deal with, but there's nine other things. It's like, sometimes you need to just, all right, although this is a tough conversation that needs to happen this time might not be it just because I'm not trying to spend the whole work day also discussing this problem at this time because I mm-hmm. need to get through that day. So learning how to manage things and what works best for you because at, at some point at the end of the day, this is all individual based on um, how you deal with something. But having a framework there to deal with it um, and uh, having a framework to deal with it. Being intentional too extremely intentional and being able to, to 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 set aside your feelings to act as matt was saying you almost um, have to be robotic about it it's, you know developing good habits yeah and working at them i think that's the the point i think i wanted to get to was that you just kind of helped me get into that direction is that people understand that habits and routine are work those are things that you have to work at it doesn't mm-hmm. come it's an active process it's not something that you automatically you just man i got Everything fell into place. Like hmm. sometimes you get lucky. It almost never but does. Luck, yeah. luck assists the people that have already prepared for opportunities. And to Lucette's point earlier, she knows that you know morale is probably low. That public opinion is negative. She's already kind of preparing to deal with those problems. What I found myself wondering is, what ch- do you want to make a change? Yes, of course. I believe that it's important in order for a community, for everyone needs to first of all take accountability because mm-hmm. it's not just police officers. We need to understand that in order for us to continue to live in a beautiful community, everyone needs to realize how am I the problem? And it starts with that. Then afterwards, once everybody realizes, okay, we want to live in good communities, what's next? What can we do? But the reason why I want to get in so bad is because I want to know what is so bad that it will make someone decide that death is an a- is the answer. And whatever it is that I can do, I don't know. I don't I don't believe in coincidences anymore. I don't question things. I go by feeling and my gut feeling, and I know that right now I need to be into law enforcement. I make good money with things what I do now, but it's not about that. It's about like. This, there's a problem in law enforcement, and I feel like God has prepared me um, in different in a, a, a lot of areas. He's gave me certain skill sets um, that I've developed that He's helped me develop in leadership, in community organizing. Because I did, com- which we haven't touched on that. Um, I did community organizing in Texas, and and because someone saw that I had this fire for truth and for fighting people appointed me to these positions so I wasn't me I wasn't looking I never liked to be Lizette now is not who I was before I was very quiet very shy but I had that fire of like no this is not right or I'll speak up and people will point me to positions the first position uh, was when my son was going to head start program in Texas which I was going through domestic violence at that time and which was a really weird situation because I was very vocal out in the community, but 
with my relationship, I was not standing up for myself, which is some another different topic on domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And um, the mental, the, the what happens to you mentally when you're going through that. Um, but so that was my first encounter, that my first experience in 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 um, um, in like a leadership position, or or like um, um, I was appointed into the the policy development because all Head Start programs. In order for you to run that program, you have to have fifteen percent of the policymakers are, are parents. Mm -hmm. So you have to be included in that. And so one of the the uh, the principal from the school where my son was at, he told me, "Hey, Lizette, you know, would you like to be a part of that group?" So he assigned, he appointed me there to that position, and ever since I liked it. I uh, and then that from there I went to community organizing, and uh, a lot of the, where I was able to see different issues within the school district. Generally, what you see is one common thing, how human beings work, how we react, what we fight for. And and that's what I started to focus on. And that's what helped me deal with the domestic violence situation because um, he he had his own trauma that he, which I don't want to talk about specifically right, because right, I want right. to respect his privacy even though he did all these things to me i still care for him as a human being because i understand that we all have traumas and we some people just don't know how to deal with it and 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 the outcome was him hurting me you know and he's the father of my youngest son and and um but i lived very horrible things with him um, um well, which this is a lot to go through but i had a lot of several sp spiritual experiences through those instances with my children um, he tied me to a chair he wanted me to drink bleach and kill his own son um, holy shit he and uh, this was in Texas when I was going there's a lot of things I went to a shelter for 30 days my oldest son became uh, a protector because of what he saw with what was happening with me and um, which I'm sure is a lot of his trauma and why he is the way he is. And um, so luckily one day I decided when the time that he tied me, because he would just, it was a small community. It was in Del Rio, Texas. It's a small town. It's a border town connected to Mexico. It's like literally 10 minutes away from Ciudad Acuña, Mexico. And so everyone knew him in the community, and he had friends, and, you know, and so they would always tell him where I was at. And I, even though I would move, he would find me. And the last time... Um, I was out and he waited for me. He went in through the window or wherever he went in through and um, he wow. covered my mouth and he threw me into the sofa and every time he would always say, this is the time I'm going to kill you. But because I learned so much about the human mind and about how we work as individuals, I learned to also be manipulative through with him. So I learned to get into his mind. I learned how to manipulate him so he can calm down to the point where I can escape. So um, that specific day when I finally decided to leave him was because I had to come to a realization that I had to literally leave the state of Texas mm -hmm. because this man was not going to leave me alone. Is he a free man or is he incarcerated? He's not incarcerated. Damn. Do you still have issues? I, I had to get a restraining order. <laughs> I don't know what happened with, like, the with the law with the you know it, it, with him getting um um actually um because th they had the detectives that went to so one of the detectives that was also doing community organizing with me because it was a small town again and you don't have to develop uh, divulge all these yeah i'm details. not gonna say that i'm um, gonna say the names but mm. but he was actually he happened to be the detective that handled my case i was beaten so bad that he didn't know it was me until he saw my ID and he didn't he saw me at the shelter he was just working the case he saw me at the shelter and he said hey Miss Vargas and then he looked at my picture and he said Lizette it's you and then I, I just put my head down because remember at the time I wasn't really like put my head down and then he started to hug me and he said you know I'm gonna find him tonight and so when I left the shelter um, I decided that I needed to leave and at the time I was 21 years old with two kids my oldest son, I had already sent him to Chicago because I had told my his, his father, because they're not the, from the same father. I told him what was going on, and he said, I need my son over here. 
So he flew him out, and, I, and it was just me and the little one, which was his son. And so that night, I said, you know what? This man's not going to leave me alone. He tied me to a chair, and he left me there. And then um, I, I was just already to the point where I was tired. I was just, like, numb. Mm-hmm. I was just taking the punches. I was just taking the – because I was tired of fighting him. And um, and I, I, there's no physical – there's no way you can – I can physically, you know, take him down. So I had learned to just stay quiet. And then finally he he un, untied me and um, he, he took me to the bed and he said, and you're going to sit here and you're not going to go to school and you're not going to go to college. And, and then so I wouldn't respond anymore. And then the baby started crying, his son, so I was holding him. And then he wouldn't allow me to lay down. So every time I would try to, like, start to get tired, he would hit me in the back and... Basically, he was re torture. That's torture. He Seriously. was redoing the same thing Actual his torture. father did to him. To me, hurt people, hurt people. Mm-hmm. That's, That's what true. we talk about a lot on the podcast. That is a fucked up, vicious, repeating cycle. It's did he did he ever do any time? At, did they ever get him no. and charge him? They Fuck. charged him for things that he did in his past, but not for what he did to me. Continue on. I'll be yeah. right. So that Damn. night, that day, the following day, when he said, "You know what? You're not gonna go anywhere." I decided that was my, uh, that was just, I had to leave. So I gathered the small, when he got up to shower, I gathered like the things that were important, like birth certificates and Mm -hmm. all that stuff. And then I just grabbed my son and then I walked out and I went to my neighbors and I told them what was happening. They called the cops, the sheriff's department arrived and um, he was hiding behind the, um, the, the fridge. (laughs) And this, I knew this (laughs) after because he this called guy. me and left a voicemail. He's I heard your conversation. I know where you're going. You're going to your brother's house. And he said, you know, you dumb bitch. I heard you. I was in the back of the fridge hearing everything. Psycho. Yeah. Fucking psycho. There is a... When you're leaving a situation, especially domestic violence, like there's certain key... Uh, things that you need to do and that you just said I'm like you need to make sure that you have all your documents in place like that was one thing that my attorney told me like you need to make sure that you prepare two to three days worth of clothes in the trunk of your car in the event where you need to like run for safety um, social security cards um, birth certificates and that's very you can't do anything without Mm -hmm that and that's exactly the first thing they go after are your documents because Mm -hmm. that's an easy way of control you can't do anything without those things and seeking help being a strong person in the community is very hard because now you have to admit that you have a problem yourself you know well to me it wasn't about like like being embarrassed or anything i was just like until i realized that man like i'm having a problem like what's wrong with this like how am I a leader in the community, but mm-hmm. I can't be a leader in your home, in my home? And I was just like, what's going on here? And then like, and, and I just, I couldn't solve that. I couldn't come to a realization of why I was allowing this to happen to me. But I mean, it was never about an image or I didn't, I've never cared about that. I've always been me. I've always just like, I don't care about what anybody says. Like no one ever asked me because I guess how I knew how to deal with trauma so well that I can just be that person that I need to be at the time that I I can close everything off Mm -hmm. and I can be that person effectively when I need to be. So I was being an effective community leader in the community, whatever I was working on. And then when I would come home, it was a whole different person. It hurt me to hear you talk about when you were beaten to the point uh, where you were not recognizable um, because I see who you are now in front of us here today and it just, you know, it, it hurts just to hear that. So really sorry to hear that um, that story, um, that that's part of who you are. And um, But you're, you're in a much better place now and um, we all here respect, you know, your passion and your willingness to get involved and to try to make a change um, you know, uh, this police officer suicide awareness walk, it did make the news, and that's funny. I, I didn't realize you were involved in it. Otherwise, I would try to keep a close eye to see if I saw you in some of the pictures because the one thing I saw briefly on the news, and I, I was talking with my mom, I think, when, when this was on the news. I was a little distracted. 
but I think, and this might be Robert, I'm not sure exactly who this was, but kind of one of the leaders of the group went into each, um, like, um, district office and set off the names of the people who had killed themselves. Yeah, that was Robert. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I saw I saw him on TV speaking to the like the person who was at the front desk, mm-hmm. and then there was other officers present. Um, and I had all these feelings about the suicide awareness march that kind of I was thinking them while you were telling me that you were involved in it, and I wanted to ask you about your own feelings um, as well on it. So we'll get in, into that in a minute, but. I did see these marches and I did see them coming through the neighborhood. And the one thing that I did feel a bit bad about was that there was not more people involved. Mm. And then another thing that I felt bad about was some of the reactions from the community, which you'll be able to share a few with us as well. I was looking at a Facebook story from one of my realtors. 